So, Eric. Yeah. You know that old philosophical question: If a tree falls in the forest but no one is there to hear it, does it make a sound? Right. I, I do. I've I've read a book. I believe you. Yeah. Not all of them were coloring books. Oh. So, no, no, they all were, but there was some words. <laughs> so, when when I got to thinking about this, yeah. in the context of life in general and and the work that we've done, I, I came upon another philosophical question, which I think might resonate with you. Yeah. If a voiceover artist performs in a booth, but there is no one there to record it, will anyone care? Why would you make me think this early in the morning? <laughs> I, because I believe in you, man. <laughs> I believe in you. You know that's heavy, and 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 probably, I I think that no, no one would ever hear it. No one would ever know. Right? They couldn't care because no one would ever hear it, and we wouldn't have the some of the best experiences uh, we have in our lives. Right? Yeah. Not only the time recording it and pulling off, you know, a performance feels good. Yep. But then we've also had the amazing blessing of having people actually care about what we do way more than we ever imagined they would. So why bring this up now? Funny you should ask, but I am really looking forward to our conversation with Sean Conrad, one of our favorite engineers from the Four Kids days. Yeah, t- totally. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure he will tell you that I, I demanded he worked with me only. <laughs> I would never, I never wanted to share Which, him with any of the other directors. I'm like, no, 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 Sean's busy. <laughs> but of course, Sean would probably tell you he needed a break from me, both probably because of my intensity and also because of my pace, <laughs> right? Carpal tunnel is a well, terrible thing to have to deal with, you know? <laughs> I was going to say that's, you know, it's it's on one side of the blade, a torture, but on the other side, it's a compliment. Well, so. I'm excited that that's our guest for today. So you know what I'm going to say then. Well, before you jump to that, I also just want to make clear for the audience, and Sean does way more than record actors. He, he He's creative in his own right in so many ways, so we got a lot of stuff to talk about. I know. I'm excited. I'm excited to learn more about him, too. And he's a good friend of mine, and I'm sure that there are things that I just don't know, but I want to. So. All right. So let's get to it. Welcome to The Heart of the Cards, a conversation about creativity, inspiration, and dealing with what we're dealt. Hey, this is Dan Green. And Eric Stewart. And this is episode 23 of The Heart of the Cards Yay. with Sean Conrad. Uh, welcome, Sean. Hey, what's up, guys? What's going on? Oh, you know, <laughs> we're we're excited to talk to you today to learn so much about um, your journey in life and your creative uh, uh, passions and things like that. I, I do want to say that um, I can remember the day I met you. Um, at four kids when they brought me in to uh, to direct Yu-Gi-Oh and mm-hmm. you were the engineer that I that I first interacted with there and mm-hmm. I just knew from the moment that we sat down together um, even before we really talked about the other things in our lives that we possibly share um, some of the some of the creative outlets that we had um, that we were going to get along and that we also had uh, similar um, drives and work ethics so yep. um yeah, that was yep. a special first meeting, you know, and usually yeah. you can tell, you know, from that moment. So anyway, um, I'm just curious to hear all the other parts of your of your tale. So um, I'm excited well, to hear today. Thank you. And let me tell you this. Our meeting, our meeting almost didn't happen because when I was interviewing, I kind of was uh, like on a work break um, after doing sound for television commercials and TV shows. Before I got to Four Kids, I did the sound for quite a few of the Matrix commercials. Mm-hmm. I did sound for uh, King of the Hill. Um, I used to record uh, Brittany Murphy. And uh, I worked with Will Ferrell and all these people. But I really was in live action television commercials, a post-production engineer that would work on that kind of stuff. And I'm saying right. that to say... When I had an interview at Four Kids, I remember that the morning of the interview, I said to myself, "Ah, I really don't want to be working on cartoons. (laughs) And, and, uh, you know, uh, a friend at the time said, well, just just do the interview. You never know. And I was like, 
I know. I, I really don't feel like working on cartoon shows. But but I went anyway, and it turned out to be one of the best things I've done um, in, in my career because uh, not only did I meet you and Dan and and got into this uh, world of shows and animation that would shape the future, um, it it has um it it shaped me as well in ways that i did not know were going to happen mhm yes well that brings me to my first real question for you on today's show so i met you i don't know what you know what our ages were at that time but that was you know in a, in a later chapter or a mid chapter of our lives i'm mm-hmm. very curious the beginning your as we call it the call to adventure where you decided, or what was the influence, where mm-hmm. you said, you know what, I want to work in the entertainment industry. I want to do things that are creative. Um, where did that come from? Well, tell me about young Sean. Yeah, so young Sean uh, was on roller skates that had metal wheels, and you needed a key to adjust the size of those uh, metal wheeled skates so they fit mm-hmm. over your sneakers. Mm-hmm. Young Sean was riding bikes and trying to uh, pop a wheelie for more than three blocks at a time. Nice. Young Sean <laughs> uh, played roller hockey um, as one now tell, of- Now tell us- Well, not, that made those skates super important. Not, to, then, not sure. to interrupt you, but tell us where Young Sean was growing up too. Oh yeah. This was all happening in Brooklyn, New York. Yes, sir. It all was. happening in Brooklyn, New York. Um you know, my my mom uh, was born and raised in Guyana in South America, and she had mm-hmm. an opportunity to do nursing in Canada or New York, and she chose New York, and that's how I ended up in Brooklyn, New York. Cool. Um, but but as a kid, you know, I am I got fascinated with being outside and BMX bikes and skateboarding and roller hockey and dancing on skates and all these things until I got to the point where. Um, uh, 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 early days in high school, uh, my aunt gave me these records with people rapping on the records. And she said, you mm-hmm. should listen to this. And it was like people named Jimmy Spicer and, 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 uh, and, you know, this, this rap thing was, was happening. And, uh, I was like, wow. Okay. Interesting. A friend of mine, uh, asked me if I, if I wanted to rap with him and I said, Yes. And I did all the raps that uh, were on a cassette tape that my cousin gave me. So I pretty much stole those raps and started to become popular. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that was your first taste of of how to be excited by the prospect of performance. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, because you were also uh-huh. using your skates and you're your dancing around. So you you enjoyed sort of the spotlight in a without even really putting two and two together that that was part of being on stage. You enjoyed sort of showing that off a little too. I, I I did, but I wasn't thinking at that time about spotlight. I was, I mm-hmm. love the craft of doing things and, mm-hmm. and how they're done and how do you get really good at it? How do you, you know, how are the good people so good? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I only, I and only that was, was your, I, and that was the first time using your voice and understanding that's a different kind of of spotlight. That's a different kind of contribution, right? Uh, yeah, a different a different type of thing that I can learn. And as I as I mm-hmm. learned it, people started to talk more. Um, people and how old were you to, at this point? How old were you here? T- about twelve or thirteen years old. So and, twelve or thirteen uh, years old, you decided that the tool you were going to use for the next thing that you wanted to be good at doing mm-hmm. was your voice, even though that wasn't really what you were doing with all of these other things. You basically said, I like these records. I like the style of music. Now I'm going to do that. Yeah, it was, it was, that's impressive, but it that's was impressive. one it, of I mean, many, one yeah. of many. Um, so, so learning how to rap was no different than me on my orange skateboard trying to do a 720. It, <laughs> it was just, mm-hmm. uh, I, <laughs> I wanted to learn how to do these things, and and it had at that time nothing to do with money. What was or the drive? Can, 
Can you, can you, if you had to put a, a few words to what that drive felt like, what that pull felt like, what was it, do you think? Um, I, I saw other people doing it and I, and I just wanted to do it. it. You know, I was 13, my friend Gregory was 16 and he can pop a wheelie way longer than me. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, right, you wanted to compete. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm just like, man, how is he doing that? How is he doing right, that? Right. And, um, you know, when I was at the skating rink skating, uh, 92 KTU in New York yep. uh-huh. was going to show up at the skating rink. And when they showed up at the skating rink to broadcast their show from the skating rink, they said, hey, we're going to hmm. do a rap contest. How many of you people know how to rap? And I was like, yes, I'm going to say my cousin's <laughs> raps and go up on that microphone. I won the <laughs> rap contest and won a free <laughs> bike, a brand new bicycle. Nice. Wow. That, so you could pop wheelies with that. Well, uh, it that was, was like it a was a it was a win. bike with shocks on it, so I actually thought it was a real motorcycle. <laughs> like oh. <laughs> it was a make believe real motorcycle and mm-hmm. um and but that was the beginning of many other things to come. Uh, so was that the first time you were on stage doing your new yes. found passion? So yeah. can you tell us and the listeners, like, because I know that the first time I actually performed in front of an audience, I was incredibly nervous. But after the experience, I told myself this is either going to cripple you and you're never going to want to do it again, or it's going to change your life. And this was mm-hmm. me at like age 12. Um, yep. And after the performance, I said, this is what I want to do. That feeling made me feel like this is what I want to do. Did you have some epiphany at that moment? Was that a sort of the kickstart to what you would then become? It was still, believe it or not, one of many things I was doing. I I, uh, I, I wanted to become good at handball. Handball was this popular sport in New York. I, mm-hmm. I was mm-hmm. able to rap. So when I was rapping, yes, I was thinking about doing rap routines with my friend and there's a party coming up in Red Hook, Brooklyn. There's a, there's like a block party or a big, uh, you know, music festival. And I wanted to get ready for that. But right after that performance, I wanted to do the 720 on my orange skateboard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so that has never changed. I am the same way today. (laughs) Um, (laughs) <laughs> and, and you, you know, I tell people today, we have these hands, these feet, the eyes, the ears, the nose. And do you think that we're supposed to use all of that to do one thing for the rest of mm-hmm. our lives until we're gone? <laughs> right. Mm. Right. So, so, so that's how, that's how I feel about it. So, so going back to this little rap thing that started where I won this free bike, Later on, I started to be talked about in the neighborhood. So I'm talked about in Borough Park, Brooklyn. But then as I get better, people are saying my name in Flatbush, Brooklyn. And then... How does that feel? Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> it's it's amazing um, <laughs> that I'm be, I, I belong. I belong. Um, right. And... Uh, mm. You know, and, and and something is happening. People are talking about me. My mom is going to work and talking about me. You know, Sean won this. Look look at, you know, next thing mm-hmm. you know, um, I get with a producer that, that uh, a friend of mine introduced me to. That producer uh, met up with me one day and said I was talking to the A&R of Tommy Boy Records, Tommy mm-hmm. Boy, which has put out Planet Rock had artists like Queen Latifah, De La Soul, Digital Underground. And my producer friend, Jerry Callender, said, uh, the A&R wants to sign you. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, I never thought about that as a young kid, but here I am. Mm-hmm. Here I am. I'm, a, <laughs> you know, a few months later... I'm doing sound check with Queen Latifah, De La Soul, and and you know it's it's a little crazy. <laughs> and you were just trying to you were just trying to outshine your cousin. 
that's it. <laughs> right? That that's it. I you know, I I I learned the raps on the cassette. That's how I got the bike. Uh, I, I, the bike right. was pr- it probably right. my cousin's bike, <laughs> you know, right. if we're being honest. Um, now, are you, are you an only child? Are you an only child? I'm, I'm an only child. I'm an only yeah. child. See, I think that's another reason why we bond so much. Um, so, yeah. no, but but I'm now I just want to just take one step back because yeah. this is I mean, this is incredibly interesting. But I, I also like to sort of get the environment a little bit. Um, yep. Was mom supportive of all of these endeavors? Did she think the some of these were just a passing phase, or did, or because of the fact that you were getting some great feedback and 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 winning these contests, did she think like, hmm, this if this is something my son's going to work hard at doing, um, I'll support this? And and were there other? Because I know you you're you're going to talk about the many different things you've done, and not all of them are involved in the arts, um, right. but they all involve your passions, but. Was there anyone in your family that was involved in music and or, you know, a- any one of the creative fields? Yeah. So, so uh, let me answer the first part. M- my mom, whose love I could never come close to matching. Let me be clear with that. I can't ever come close. She was a thousand percent supportive Everything I did, mm. she said, that's great. Go for it. Mom, I need new hockey skates. Okay. I thought I just got you skates, but let's go get some more. Uh, I need more hockey sticks. <laughs> I need uh, music equipment. What? Just totally supportive. Mm-hmm. Um, so I never had any block from my mom. The second mm-hmm. part of your question with you know somebody in music being in the family... It wasn't that. I I had a friend that lived in my building and when I started junior high school, he said he said, "Oh, you're going to Pershing Junior High School. When you get there, just tell everybody I'm your cousin and you'll be good. you'll be good." <laughs> I, I I I got to 7th grade. I said, "Hey, um I'm Paul's cousin." And everybody said, "Oh, okay." Here's where that is. Here's where that is. And let us know if you need anything. <laughs> what was the legend that Paul left behind that gave you such If cachet? he tells you, he'd have to kill you. So just be <laughs> Oh, well, okay. Paul knew, Paul already knew about what was going on in music. He was older than me. So Paul knew about uh, all these older hip hop clubs where Cool Mo D mm. used to hang out and Grandmaster Kaz and... All these places that I couldn't go because my allowance only added up to a, a dollar twenty five. So mm-hmm. I, and and mm-hmm. I was too young. Um, but so Paul was a big influence. He 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 said uh, he used to know these raps, and then you know he before ever going to karate school, he he knew karate already. You know, Paul was this big a uh, person to me, this big persona, and and that's how I started really get into into music. He introduced me to Howie T, who is the producer of Special Ed and Chub Rock. And and mm-hmm. you know, he he brought me to the Roxy where Rock Steady Crew mm. was breakdancing right in front of me and and a uh, Red Alert mm-hmm. and Africa Bambata and all you know, that was Paul. I couldn't get there without Paul. Mm-hmm. So that's that's, that's cool. where this this musical pathway started to grow. Wow. And how much older was he? Paul was probably four years older than me, somewhere somewhere around four years old. Nice. So that's a real older brother range. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> you know, the day I, inv- I, I invited Paul to that first show as a Tommy Boy artist, where I was, you know, going to be with Latifah and De La Soul, and, and, and Paul just said, wow, you are doing big things. And I, I felt so good to tell the person who led me to all of this, man, guess what? <laughs> you know, I, I got a deal. I'm, I'm going to be on the radio. You know, mm-hmm. it, it was, uh, I could barely describe that, you know? Um, mm-hmm. so, so that's where, that's where things started happening. And, and, you know, I, I don't want we don't have to spend a lot of time on the music piece, but there's some bigger things that happened or that was going to happen even after Tommy Boy musically that, mm-hmm. 
you know, it, it's even when I think about it today, it's like, whoa, you know, it's like Forrest Gump. Like, like, right. did you really, you met the president <laughs> and you were the maker of the ping pong, you know, th- like, right. yeah, yes. Well, like well, you said, right. like you said, you've done it, you've done a bunch of things and I do want to touch upon, um, I know that Dan and I want to talk about all of those things because I think that it's all important so that we get a better sense of who Sean is. Um, yeah. But before we leave the music side or take a a, a, a diversion to a different topic, um, mm-hmm. something I think that's also important to our listeners who might um, have the passion to be involved in the music industry or or whatever um, mm-hmm. in, in terms of music, um, can you also give them some words of advice about maybe some of the uh, – like a challenge or a trial, something that was um, an experience you had in that – part of the business that taught you something or how you got through it? Um, yeah, I, I, you know, one thing comes to You don't to have mind to name and, names. You don't have to name names, but just something that might just show that, <laughs> hey, you know, this all came to me. It, it, you know, almost seems like it, it was effortless, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, here's that road that I was on and here's the roller coaster and here's how I got through that part to get to the next chapter of what I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um... When I uh, met this producer who Paul introduced me to, Jerry Callender, who met the A&R of Tommy Boy and I eventually got a deal, you know, as I was working with Jerry Callender, he had other artists that he was producing that, mm-hmm. you know, we're all just trying to get record deals. And, but I, I was one of the popular uh, artists in his camp. So everybody was saying, Sean, uh, or my, they were using my stage name, Freshco. They said, Freshco Mm -hmm. is going to get a deal. And um, man, this is going to be great. What actually happened was a girl he was working with before me named LaShawn got her deal first. And Mm -hmm. uh, just for your listeners, LaShawn is the voice on LL Cool J's record, Doing It Well. Who's saying, Mm -hmm. doing it and doing (laughs) it and doing it well. That's LaShawn. When she got signed, I... At that moment, I, I I was happy for her, but I was like, wow, I still don't have a deal. And everybody was telling me I would be the first. Mm-hmm. And I, <laughs> it was a test of my faith. You know, like, mm-hmm. what happened? What happened? What, what, what happened? What went wrong? And um, I just needed to stay the course and, and not, mm-hmm. not pay attention to what order it happened in. I, I I just needed to to do what I was doing. And 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 that's now that I'm conscious of that, I share that with people today. I tell people all the time, you're not gonna start making your history at an upcoming date. You you are in your history making right now. So mm-hmm. so be active. That's a great way to put it. Thank you. Thank you. Be active. And and it, it will start to form itself. These things that you are doing now will be talked about, will be part of mm-hmm. your history, your, your road traveled. Um, and I think b- before people get famous, they don't realize that. They, they think, oh, I get signed, and then whenever I win the Grammy, that starts my historic legend. Right. And, and, and I don't think that's true. I think you're in it. Mm-hmm. It's happening before you realize. It's it's happening. It's happening. You're right. gonna you're, you're gonna tell people about the demos you made before you made your first hit record. That's mm-hmm. part of the history. Where were you? Um, you know, the the Beatles played in places that didn't have windows. Sometimes, you know, <laughs> um, for for, for for years. But but you. You know that's that's part of their journey. But the first time you heard of them was was their song on the radio. But if you ever talk to mm-hmm. any of them, there, there's a whole history. There's a whole, you know, right. we work with this person. Uh, you know, we couldn't we couldn't get signed. You know, I I can tell you about one of the biggest artists in the world who could not get signed by anyone. <laughs> That's crazy. That it's also. I just noticed that's the second time you you use the word radio, which to some of our followers, I don't I think they have perhaps an understanding of how big a deal radio used to be. Not that it's completely uh, insignificant now, yeah. 
But back in the day, yeah. I mean, that was the lifeline. That was it. That that yeah. that was like, yeah. That was a that was a, a musical artist's version of being on television. Of course, they do that too, or being in the movies. You know, like yeah. that was your main exposure. And yeah. Yeah. Sean was also talking about people were talking about him. So this is like pre all the social media craziness. I'm not trying Correct. to date us, Sean. But right, this is but, the original that, social media. But that truly <laughs> means that it media. was it was word of mouth. <laughs> It, 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 Pe- was, yeah. it was people talked mouth. about you to other people in person, right? Yes, uh, you know. Yes. So, 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 the fact that a buzz was being created about who you were, uh, you know, that way is also, you know, it's a testament to like you know what the ability was, what the talent was. Is that you know there wasn't like I could just go online, you know, right this second and find like three thousand people that are doing the same kind of thing. It's like, well, how do I even pick? Right which one I want to listen to. It's like, if you stood out when there was no, you know, uh, amazing amount of social media going on, then you truly were standing out for a reason. So so you were doing that. But I also know just from a little bit, so you were also involved in other things too. Like, tell me what was going on. You were, you were never just doing one thing at, at, at a time. We know that based on your statement earlier in the show. So what yeah. else was going on at that same time revolving around this incredible rap career? Uh, well, um, <laughs> when you're 20-something years old, it is possible that things can be happening so constantly and so quickly, you are not taking them as seriously as you should. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't, I don't want to say I was careless um, but I got to a point where people were like, Hey, uh, I just bought a magazine. Uh, you're in the centerfold and there's a full page article with you in it. And I would, w- would respond to that person by saying, thanks, save me a copy and just go about, mm-hmm. just go to the basketball court and sh- shoot hoops or something. Um, to answer your question more specifically, at around that time, I thought to myself, you know, I uh, I I can act. I I can do all these characters, and I would have my camera and do and do all these different accents and everything. I recorded myself, sent a tape into some acting agencies, and I got uh, signed or or represented. Uh, by two acting agencies. What this wow. led to was I did one of the first commercials for Red Bull when Red wow. Bull <laughs> when Red Bull was selling beer. <laughs> wow. So so that was happening. Um <sighs> you know again the the, the music thing was still happening in the background. So I would, I I was on tour with Ice Cube, Too Short, Kid Rock, D-Nice. And, and, and then we'd fly back to do Yo! MTV raps. I, I did that, you know, with Ice T. And, and, and then around 93 or so, I meet the Notorious B.I.G. who says, I know all your words to your record. I'm a big fan of yours. And he starts rapping the lyrics to my record and wow. then tell and then tells me, I'm not gonna mm. rap with you on a recording because you're not gonna embarrass me. <laughs> and um, what that kind of compliment. It, it, yeah, it was a compliment and he meant it because he kept repeating it. But the funny thing is, no one else would know, but this already happened. Ice Cube said the same thing to me. We were on tour in Ice Cube's hotel room and we're all rapping, myself, Yo-Yo, people from other groups. And I said, go ahead, Cube. And Cube said, I'm not rapping with you. I know who you are. I know you do that fast rap stuff and I'm not messing with you. <laughs> so so these are <laughs> these are experiences that I'm logging, but each person doesn't know this already happened, um, mm-hmm. you know, and and I'm you know I'm just sharing this because this this is all right before four kids before you and I mm-hmm. met, but but right. you know uh, 
Red Man, uh, you know, uh, who's, you know, done so many records with Method Man from Wu-Tang. Before his album dropped, he watched me win the rap contest. I showed it to him and he said, I'm the best rapper he's ever heard. Uh, Busta Rhymes. Wow. Busta Rhymes asked me to come to see one of his first shows at the Apollo. When he walked away, I I took I looked at my friend Troy and I said, "That guy looks familiar. What's his name again?" And Troy said, "I think his name is Busta or or something like that." And I was like, "Okay, I'll see if I could go to his show." So this this was happening over and over again, and I was. So into life, they they were almost casual occurrences for me. So I do want to point out, and this is this is uh, something that that's sort of another one of my mantras: is there's a yeah. difference between ego and confidence. And um, one of the things that I think is another reason why we sort of clicked when we met is because. Mm-hmm you do come across with the confidence side. And that is knowing that what you do, you do well. Not necessarily you do, even though you have gotten these compliments from from people that are uh, even mentors who have said, Mm -hmm. hey man, Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna even mess with you because what you're gonna do is gonna embarrass me. But the way you carry yourself throughout whatever you're pursuing has always come across as someone who believed in themselves. And that... And that, to me, is also, um, you know, that's magnetic. That mm. helps us as performers. That helps us as entertainers is that you can walk that fine line. Because yeah. if you go too far towards the ego side, you can offend, right? Who does this yeah. guy think he is? Yeah. But, if you all, but if you walk on that other side, you're saying, hey, you know, um, I'm good at what I do. Um, yep. and people say, yeah, he's good at what he does. And, and that's, what's, that's, what's something that has, uh, it's, it's been part of your personality on the outside to me as a friend mm-hmm. Who, mm-hmm. who's witnessed that. And I think that that's a key element to maybe what you have been able to rely on to do the things that you love to do without feeling that there are, um, you know, guidelines you've got to follow or there's there's only Correct. one path or there's only one set of rules. Yep. Right now you've told us about successes where your path is not one that I would have mapped out. Yeah. So that's just part of it's something that I've yeah. noticed about you as a, as as one of your friends for so many years. I I just think that that's something that you you've shown to me as a person. I, I, I appreciate you saying that. And, and um, you know, my thing, when, when I was younger, I saw celebrities and I saw that celebrities were big deals, you know, and, and they, uh, you know, they, they were up there. They don't, they don't mess around with common folks, so to speak. And I, for the, as long as I can remember, even when I was doing these things in the music industry, I wanted to come home and go to 53rd Street Park and play basketball with my friends. Mm-hmm. And I, I've i gotten asked many times in this same question, what are you doing here? It, it even happens today sometimes. I meet people, if they find out who I am, they say, what are you doing here? Why, why are you here? Mm. And, and um, for me, uh, you know, I want to make sure people know I'm not living up there. I'm never living up there and somebody's down or to the side. Mm-hmm. I, it's important that people know um, I am approachable. I can show you how to do this too. And um, mm-hmm. I don't care what you're driving. I don't I don't care what size your house is. Um, I, I want you to uh, communicate with me freely and not mm-hmm. not try to match something you heard that I did. That is very very important to me till this day. It's very important. You know, I'm not surprised to hear you say that, Sean, because that's exactly the kind of energy you put out. You, I, I, I having known nothing about you before I met you, 
I was like, here's this guy. He seems like he's, you know, he's got a good head on his shoulders and he seems positive um, and and also just totally, totally present. I didn't get any sense of attitude or, you know, uh, that you you thought you were all that. Um, and so I think you succeed in, in achieving that 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 balance uh, that is, is so important to you. So, yeah, I, I, well done. I was also thinking. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I appreciate that, Dan. And, you know, uh <laughs> I, I think um, you know. I actually I actually learned that from somebody. Um, you know, another rapper, Big Daddy Kane. Um, we used to hang out back in the day, and and one time he asked me to, to give him a ride to his house, and I uh, I was driving this burgundy Buick, and I knew he was one of the biggest rappers on the planet. And as we were walking to my car. I, I said, listen, I don't drive a BMW or a Mercedes. I wanted to warn him and give him a way out. And he <laughs> he responded to me and said, I don't care what you drive. We're just trying to get from point A to point B. To, to back that up, I stopped at Great my words. house. Um, he got out of the car and was walking in my neighborhood with me, plain as day, in my little apartment, and just backed it up. And that was a big lesson for me. So I, I yeah. uh, that's part of where that came from, Dan. Um, I, I don't want anybody to feel like they have to match something they heard about me because that's, that's, mm-hmm. it's no way to live. It's no, it's no way to right. live, be, right. live freely. So that's, that's why, you know, meeting you and meeting Eric and, you know, I, I, I don't, you probably didn't know anything about my music career for quite a while. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's true. Thank you for all of that. And um, yep. I think this would be a good place to pause our conversation. We got a good sense of your background and your foundation. And if we could save the next part for part two in terms of how that sent you forward and, and how that got us all to get to know each other, yeah. um, I think that would be great. What do you guys think about that? I think That's it's great, awesome. and I'm going to take out uh, my Roxanne Roxanne record right now, my 12 minutes, and I'm going to go listen to that before the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great, man. Thanks, guys. And also, thanks to everyone, as always, who are following along and listening to The Heart of the Cards, a conversation about creativity, inspiration, and dealing with what we're dealt. Thanks for listening to The Heart of the Cards with Dan Green and Eric Stewart. We hope this conversation in some way spoke to you. Whatever your journey, we look forward to crossing paths again in the next episode. This is Veronica Taylor, and on behalf of Andromeda Productions, we wish you well. Andromeda, always a sound choice.